In this video, we'll be doing a teardown of the Berman CP gearbox fitted to the matchless G3L WD. The reason why I'm doing the teardown of my box is to investigate a noise from the transmission. And here it is. You'll notice the noise happens when I put the brake on and also happens when I'm moving along in gear and out of gear and I've taken the chain case off uh, to investigate the noise because my first thought was either the clutch was slipping or maybe the primary chain was rubbing on the chain case neither of which turned out to be the cause. Now here I'm just using a stethoscope to see if there are any really obvious noises from a pinpoint location or whether there's anything uh, preventing the wheel turning freely in neutral, neither of which turned out to be the case. So really there's no option. We've got to get the gearbox out and have a look inside. But the first stage of this job is to remove the chain case from the left-hand side. Now we've already made a video of that, so please refer to that uh, if you don't know how to do it, and then come back here when you've got the chain case off. The foot peg on the left should have been removed to get into the chain case, so now we'll just pull out the shaft that joins them together from the right side. The peg itself can just be wiggled out of position. Now undo the bolt securing the front exhaust bracket. And then the rear one. This gets really mucky so a bit of penetrating spray is a good idea. You can now gently twist and wiggle the silencer free. The exhaust head is held on by an L-shaped bracket with two nuts and bolts. I find it easier to take them both off and then wiggle the exhaust header free. You may need to lift the gear lever a little to get the header out because it has a spigot at the bottom which goes down into the bracket. Now to the left side of the bike to undo the clutch springs. There is a proper tool for this but if you're too tight like me to buy one then just using a pair of um, pincers is quite good to get it going and then you can use a flathead screwdriver to get it out completely. In addition to the screw and the spring, each one has a little collar that you need to remove as well before you can take the clutch plate off. Now to get the clutch plates out. Having done this a few times, I've developed a really quick method. Use a magnetic puller to get the pressure plates off, and then just a small screwdriver to wiggle the friction plates off. And if you alternate between the two tools, you can get them out really quickly. To get the rest of the clutch internals out, we'll start by applying the rear brake and undoing the nut in the centre of the clutch. Underneath the nut there'll be a washer. And now you'll see that I'm holding a magnetic tray underneath the clutch internals. And that's because behind the next bit, 
there are 24 roller bearings and when they come loose if you don't catch them they'll roll all around the garage floor and have a party and you'll never find them. Here's a better view of the roller bearings now, the shiny round things you can see. Luckily for me they stayed in. So now I'm removing the primary chain just by taking off the split link and then taking the chain off. And by doing this really carefully, I've managed to get the clutch basket away with all the roller bearings and the magnetic tray underneath it so I catch every single one first time. To remove the front sprocket, just move the brake pedal out of the way, put an impact driver or a wrench onto the sprocket nut and undo it. That springy thing behind it is a shock absorber which helps to smooth out the bumps from the engine. Now for the dynamo sprocket, there's a little spring clip on here which needs to be removed and then a washer with a tab on it. Now the dynamo nut holding the sprocket on will turn when you try and undo it and there's a special tool you can use to hold it from the back because the space is too thin for a spanner but again, if you're a tight wad like I am, you can get around this by just stuffing an old t-shirt into the front of the sprocket to stop the chain turning and then it'll come off easy as. The dynamo sprockets are usually jammed on pretty hard and you'll need some kind of puller to remove it. The one I had didn't quite fit so I had to put one of the legs in sort of jammed up against the chain case then assemble the puller and then uh, screw it in until it came off. I didn't manage to film the moment critique when it came off, uh, but uh, th these are the tools I used for it. And then you pull off uh, the dynamo, the chain, the dynamo sprocket rather, the chain and the front sprocket all at once. Now undo the three chain case bolts at the front and the bolt that connects the chain case to the battery holder. Now the chain case can be removed easily. Now this is the sprocket on the main gear and it needs to be loosened, not removed, but just loosened. And it's much easier to do that with the rear drive chain on. I didn't have a spanner big enough, so I just used a pair of plumbing grips and I managed to loosen it quite easily. Now there should be a locking washer behind this, but my bike didn't have one, so I've ordered one for when I put it back together. Now we remove the rear chain by taking off the split link, separating the chain, and then just feeding it over the sprockets. If you've noticed a rather romantic soft focus effect on the camera, that's because of all the grease on my gloves as I've been turning it on and off and moving it around. Which brings out the point that this is quite a messy job and you'll definitely need lots of pairs of gloves and lots of Kim Wipe or Blue Roll uh, to clean yourself up. Now back to the right hand side of the bike and time to remove the five retaining nuts that hold the Kickstarter case, which is the first layer of the gearbox. If you've got the matchless maintenance manual, it'll tell you to take off the kickstart lever and the gear shift lever first, but I don't recommend this because you'll need them to get leverage to pull the kickstart case off. I lay them out in a pattern 
which resembles how they fit into the gearbox and then photograph it for reference later. Next I used a gear lever and a kickstart lever to gently manoeuvre the kickstart case away from the gearbox housing. The aim here is not to remove it completely but just to create a gap of a centimetre or so. Now by going in through the hole in the top of the gearbox where we put the grease, I can reach in and disconnect the clutch cable from its actuating lever. Now there's nothing to prevent the kickstart case coming cleanly away. Now it's time to get the excess grease out and clean up the gearbox a bit. The rod that actuates the clutch goes through the middle of the main shaft. When I push it from the other side of the bike I'm expecting one ball bearing to drop out. But in fact my bike's got two. Another surprise awaits me when I undo the clutch adjuster which screws into the back of the gearbox shell. As I work it loose and remove its retaining nut free, I can see that the adjuster has actually snapped in half. That explains why I couldn't get too much adjustment earlier. Time to order a new one. Unfortunately, you have to order the whole thing with the cable as well. Here's the outside of the gearbox now looking a little bit cleaner. And here's the kickstart cover from the inside. On the left you can see the gear selector mechanism. On the right the spring to return the kickstart. And poking out through the hole at the top is the actuator lever for the clutch. Now as I try and take off the kickstart here it becomes apparent that this isn't a Whitworth nut. I'm in danger of rounding it off. So I quickly swap it for a metric socket and all is well again. And this is quite common with old bikes. You might find that previous owners have used metric parts and you just got to be really careful. Once the nut and the bolt have been removed the kickstarter will just come off its spline really easily and then you can withdraw the spline from the other side of the case. Removing the gear lever was much more troublesome. After I took off the nut and bolt, it was just firmly attached to the spline. I tried penetrating spray and gentle wiggling, but it didn't work. So in the end, I used a flathead screwdriver just to prise open the open end and give it a little tap with a persuader, and off it came. And here's the gear changing mechanism, uh, which if you're in any doubt about it, you can just pull it apart with your fingers. It goes back together really easily and you can check the state of the poles and the springs. But this one was fine. Now you can see three shafts in the box. The top one, which I'm working on here, is the main shaft. And then you've got the lay shaft, which is bottom left, and then the cam, which is bottom right. And we need to take off the pinion at the end of this which is what operates the Kickstarter, or rather the Kickstarter operates it. So first we take off the nut, and then that spacer underneath it, which looks a bit like a washer, is kind of serrated, and it meshes into the pinion itself, and then underneath that, we've got a spring. What isn't immediately obvious is that there's a cylindrical spacer inside this lot, so I've laid it all out so that you can see it. It's important not to lose this. The bearing at this end of the gearbox main shaft has a washer. In my case, it's split and I'll have to replace it. The inner case is held on by four nuts, which should be pretty easy to undo.
each nut has a grippy little washer underneath it, which isn't immediately obvious because of all the grease. The inner case should be free to wiggle off now, but I find mine a little bit stiff, so I just use a couple of gentle taps with a mallet. Now you'll notice in the final stages as I pull it off, I'm being really careful because some of the older models of Berman gearboxes, sort of before 1943, had roller bearings around where, where the cam uh, engages, and if they come out, they'll go everywhere. I was uh, happy to find that mine had a bush instead of the bearing, so I didn't have to worry. We're getting pretty close to being able to remove the gears now, but before we try that, we must undo the grub screw here, behind which is a spring and a plunger, and then above that an indexing member, which goes into the cam. Now we can just simply pull off the third gear cog, which is free floating. Moving to the left hand side of the bike, we can now withdraw the main shaft. And then undo the nut, retaining the sprocket. We can gently wiggle the sprocket itself off. and then underneath the sprocket is a spacer. And here's what that looks like from the other side of the bike. Now from the end of the lay shaft, I remove a washer and the last gear. And then the whole of the remaining arrangement can be withdrawn in one go. And now all that remains to complete the disassembly is to remove the outer shaft uh, to which is attached the main gear, which you can see me wiggling here. I couldn't quite push this out with my fingers, so we cleaned it up a little bit and gently tapped it through with a rubber mallet and it came out easy as. And now with all the gears out, you can have a good look at it and check for bent selector forks, damage to the gears, damage to the shaft, and find out what's giving you the problem. And in the case of my gearbox, there was no damage, nothing I could see at all. And the selector forks were completely true, not bent, not chipped, not scored. Everything looked really good. But there was a problem when we looked at the main shaft bearing. So here I'm removing the circlips and the washers uh, that seal the bearing and keep the grease in.
What I didn't realise here is that if you look at the housing at about the 11 o'clock, there's a little neat notch there which helps you remove this spacer. But I didn't notice it, so you can enjoy watching me struggle. And this is where I realised we were closing in on the problem as I was tapping out the bearing, which I was expecting to be really firmly seated in its housing, it sprang out really quickly and easily. And so it wasn't being held in the housing tight enough. And then when I cleaned up the housing and had a look inside, there were the telltale witness marks of scratching where the bearing had been rotating in its own housing and that's what caused the noise. Finally we found the problem. So that completes the teardown of the Berman CP gearbox for my matchless G3 LWD. I hope you found that useful. Uh, if you've got anything to add, any hints or tips, uh, then please get in touch. And here's a summary of all the steps.